edition which uh, carries on the work of putting the track in at Elven Home but with real uh, momentum and actually doing some track laying uh, and some points. Uh, having finished throwing drills around the place it's amazing how much you can get done. Uh, I also in Tool Time Tips show you things about measuring uh, and also take a look at the next stage of the work in converting the signal box from an O double O scale uh, drawing into N-Gage. Just a short section on that this week and also a return of train cam and I'll talk a little bit more about train cam at the end. So let's get on with the video and I'll speak to you again at the finish. Time to move on to the next stage of the build of the uh, signal box. Uh, you'll see here that I have the window section that you saw me build last time round. That still only has white primer on it. Uh, the windows themselves will remain white, but I am going to paint the what would be the um, surrounds of the of the window frames uh, in the in the uh, maroon color to match the rest of the building uh, of the station. So I'll move that out the way, and what I've now done is cut out what will become the carcass of the signal box. Uh, so obviously these are the two side walls. I suppose that should be that way around really which has the two doors in, taken from the plan of uh, the plan that Paul Chapman at Galgorm Hall uh, created. This is the front wall, the rear wall, and then these four pieces make up the lean-to that goes at the back of the signal box. Uh, I won't be doing any more with these just for the minute, because the first thing I want to do is to create the core of the signal box and then clad it. And to clad it, I'm going to use a actually that's a bit out of scale this is is um, oh I can't remember which one it is I don't think it's plastruct but it's one of the brick paint brick cards uh, plastic uh, and I think if I bring it in and try and get it to focus there we go that is probably double O scale because those are quite big bricks um, but I think I want to go with this I use this on the fire station rather than N-gauge size because uh, I think the N-gauge size is much smaller and it's much harder to get the effect of having grout I found um, just because everything is so much smaller. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is create the core of the box and make sure that I'm happy with how that looks well, as against the windows and then let's put you back in focus that's that's quite nice isn't it like putting a pair of glasses on uh, and then i will if i'm happy with the the core uh, then i will add the the uh, plastic uh, bricks to the outside uh, and then i can build this onto the back um, because i think it's a lean to i i think paul actually put that on the back first so i may think again about that actually I may not clad the back until I've got the lean-to on because I have some material for the lean-to which I think will just about fit the bill. So that's all. That's the only bit of stage I'm going to now. Uh, I'm going to work on that. I'm not sure you'll see it in this video but there's no rush to build this uh, and I'll probably show the next stage of the work on this in the next video. This section just talks you through the wiring that I've done for this part of uh, High Oven. These two wires that you can see coming up here are for the um, power bus and they go to the plug type terminal blocks. I'll show you them in just a minute in a bit more detail. Essentially, well I can show you here actually. So this is a plug that fits in to this side and the beauty of that as I've used elsewhere on the layout is that it does allow you um, more flexibility than if you're using normal terminal blocks where the wire would go essentially into these part into these two parts here and you'll see from the power bus I've split uh, two separate channels one is for the points which are going to be run by a, an accessory decoder and the other is for the track um, that's so that if I have a problem with one or the other um, I, I at least know which which I've got the problem with uh, rather than it affecting everything coming off that um, that connection. If we go down a little, uh, the value of the new uh, gimbal, I can and come out a bit. Oh, sorry about that. There you go. Um, what we have here 
is the underside of the board. Uh, you can see the point motors in place. There's four of those that run just through there. And the point motors are wired into the accessory decoder. And the accessory decoder has its own supply. So that's the bit that plugs in to the socket that's sitting on the bench. And that runs those points. And I'll come back and show you those working in, in a bit. The blue and brown wires are the ones that live are droppers essentially. And what I've done there is using an ordinary set of terminal blocks where the, the things are just held either side is essentially to bring the power in. And here's the, the plug that will bring the power in. So the brown goes into this side, the blue goes into this side. And then I've just daisy chained these along here to draw individual droppers off which are then go up and are soldered to the track. Uh, and although that is a bit of a rat's nest, you may think, for me, that is amongst the most tidy wiring I have ever done. So what I'll do now is get this back up on top of the layout and then talk you through the interesting time I had fitting the point motors this time round. So I'll come back to you in just a moment. There you see that the power is in. Uh, the point, points that you saw it traverse have all been changed with the accessory decoder, which is accessed through, if I bring this down here, uh, accessed through the, the handheld. Instead of um, putting loco numbers in, this one up here is for accessories. And you type in the accessory number, so number 28, which is one of the point numbers. And then you choose one or two to change the point. So that's the wrong way. There you go, you heard it click. Uh, and that, so the four points up here are now operated from my handheld and will be able to be operated um, from the Wi Fi um, on my iPad. Uh, and that once I get comfortable doing that, probably in the next edition, I will show you that as the build up here uh, goes on. Uh, to talk about what. Um, what has been an interesting process that took me much longer than I thought. First of all, you'll see that the uh, inspection pit has been sunk into the baseboards. The router attachment for the Dremel is very good. And I may include it in a tool time tip on the basis. It's not really for scratch building, but it would be useful for people to see it. It costs about £30. Um, I, the first, I had to do this freehand because uh, obviously, I didn't have a straight edge against which I could use the edge guide, and in any way, this was too far into the baseboard. Uh, the first um, part of the line, I did that. I, I routed the the groove in strips because the the drill bit, the bits you get for routing are not wide enough to be able to do the width that I needed. I got a bit excited with the second line, so it went a bit wider than I intended. But fortunately, the inspection pit has covered most of my um, youthful exuberance with the uh, uh, with the router. So that went down and in. One thing I would say, uh, which I was a bit disappointed about, the rails that go into, into that, that's, that comes in sections. I'm trying to think how many sections. There's one, two, three sections, four, five, six. And you can build it, obviously, to any length that you like. When you use the whole thing in one go like this, these two sets of rails, because there's four rails, butt up. Uh, but I can tell you they don't provide electrical continuity. Because when I'd finished this and I put the power in at the end of these rails, the Jinty happily set off and stopped dead here. So I've put some additional droppers in here, which gives power between where it stops there and then the points uh, up the top. Fitting the point motors has been the devil's own job. Um, when I fitted all the point motors for the TMD, for the uh, Motive Power Depot, um, I must have been extraordinarily lucky because I pretty much offered the, the um, point up to the, uh, the point motor up to the point, a little bit of a twiddle, click, 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 everything worked, screwed it in, that was it done. And they were very, very easy to do. These, on the other hand, have been most finicky. They really did not want to work. I put all four point motors in and I didn't go one at a time testing. 
and only one point motor worked, which was the one here. Uh, and I was I was rather downcast at that point because I feared that the the, um, the capacity discharge unit that's in the accessory decoder may not have been power, powerful enough to throw the points. But because one of them worked, that that didn't seem very likely. And when I disconnected one of the point motors, it immediately threw quite happily one way to the other. So it had to be the way I'd fitted them. Uh, and I discovered that they, they were very, very finely balanced to ensure that unless the point motor was absolutely parallel below the point with the tie bar, um, it was obviously not trying to travel in a straight line and that was making it difficult to throw. But after much effort and uh, repositioning and uh, positioning the, the point blades in the center and holding them there and generally fiddling around, each and every one of them now work fully. I have tested that I haven't wired this section up the opposite way round to the, to the track that's on the other side. Uh, so when I join it up to the rest of the layout, I'm not going to get an immediate short. So I do now have all the track wired, all the point motors in, and the next thing is going to be looking at the buildings and getting those in. Uh, and I've had a bit of a change of heart with how I'm going to wire those up, which means it's unlikely. It's just a chance I may be able to get them into this video because I'm recording this on the Tuesday after the last video went up, having spent the weekend tearing my hair out. Um, but it occurred to me that although I'm putting, obviously I'm putting some lights in, in here for the train shed, I'm going to put some, I'm going to put a light into the uh, engine shed and then uh, two lights in the good shed. I'm building the uh, signal box, which will probably have a light in it. And this area is going to be the village of High Elven, which sits perched high above everything else with pretty sheer fa rock faces below it. Uh, and I'm going to want to put lights into that as well. And so in thinking about how I wire up all the lights here, I need to have a view of, of, for the future, quite a bit of the future. And in that case, the more sensible thing for me to do is to buy another of the power distribution boards that you've seen me buy before, which would allow me to wire up, I don't know, 40 or 40 something sets of lights. Not that I'll have that many. Um, and have that below this baseboard and everything wired into that. And that's a different approach to what I was going to do, which was essentially copper strips underneath to which all the lights would go and then power coming into the copper strips. The other advantage of the distribution board is that I can set it to bring the voltage down from 12 volts to 3 volts, which is what I need the um, voltage to be for the lights that I'm using. And I don't then need to put in individual resistors or a resistor in the system because it's being done by the distribution board. So um, as I said, I may not get onto that, the wiring of the lights um, in, in doing that. What I will be working on now is, is the signal box and also completing the building of the buildings that are going to go on here so that they're ready to be put in situ when I'm ready to do the lighting. I won't put them on before because I'm going to have to lift this board back off again and they'll all, so they'll all have to come off again. Uh, but I do need to complete them with things like gutters and the rest. And I'll probably move on that now at some point in this video to show that work completing. But this shows you the work that I've spent the last three days doing, um, which has been the most frustrating thing. But uh, I, I learned a lot from it. And if I need to do any more uh, motors, I will, I will not be so cavalier. I must have been extraordinarily lucky when I did the 20 odd motors that sit under the main board. If I just spin around gently so that you don't get sick, um, that sit under the main board here. Uh, and you can see the, the wires coming out. So uh, that's that for the moment. And uh, we'll move on to the next part of the video. Well, time for tool time tips. And uh, as we've completed already looking at uh, cutting and gluing, I thought it was get good to get on with measuring. And these are very much the things that I use to help me with scratch building. Uh, one thing I don't use for measuring, which may surprise you, is a ruler. 
The ruler I use as a straight edge for cutting. Um, the part of the problem is that this most rulers, or, or very few rulers, let me put it the other way around, actually have a measure from one end to the other. Uh, you'll see with this one that there is probably seven or eight centimeters gap um, and similarly at the other end. Um, it's very easy to knock this and be out by a millimeter or two and you just can't afford that amount of error particularly when you're going working in quite small scale like n scale six inches in n scale in real life is the equivalent of one millimeter so if you're a millimeter or two out you're significantly out in terms of cutting overall so i use that as uh, to cut and it's a good uh, ruler with uh, these two rubber things to hold it down, but I don't use it for measuring. Move that out the way. Um, these are, or you'll remember from your school days, a protractor and a set square. Very useful for drawing, um, mainly for being able to draw straight lines in smaller spaces. Uh, the protractor, protractor is used for measuring because that's its purpose, to help you measure angles. And that was absolutely key for me when I was making the viaduct. Um, in getting all the uh, angles right to be able uh, to get the back papers absolutely to match up with the front where the portals were for the viaduct. But the two things that I do use are in front of you now. This is uh, made by Pico. Let's make sure you're in focus. And it is an N scale ruler. And what you'll see, it's measured across the top in the equivalent in feet but obviously measured at 1 to 148 size. And along the bottom, you'll see that there are various things that are uh, there to help you um, measure specific things that are to do with uh, N scale. That's really useful for overall sizing. So if you think, does that thing look right prototypically, you can measure it against this, and this will tell you what the real world equivalent of a thing would be. And quite often when I've thought that looks a bit small to me, you measure it against this and you see, no, that is the right size. You're just working in a very small scale. Uh, the main thing that I spend my time uh, measuring with is this pair of vernier calipers. Now, um, you can get digital versions of this. Uh, and if, you're, if you don't have one, I would suggest you buy them. I've got used to using this. Um, this, I'm told, I think, can measure down to 0.2 of a millimetre, which is a degree of precision that I simply can't um, achieve with a, um, a blade that is thicker than 0.2 millimetres. But I am able to go to the nearest half millimetre. Um, the, the scale, as you see, when you open this out, this is for measuring an, in, uh, an external distance. These are for measuring an internal distance. So obviously you slip that into whatever is either side. And at the end here, this is a depth gauge essentially. So you'll see how valuable this is for being able to measure and measure accurately. And if I just bring this up here, um, the zero is where you would place it. So for example, if we want to do uh, 10 and a half millimeters, you place this first of all on the 10, and then looking at the five, you move the five, and I'm doing this through the camera, until it, it lines up with the nearest, there we go, one above. And that is now set at 10 and a half millimeters. Uh, that's the de degree of precision you can get. And you can use this, I would use this then against card, for example, uh, like that. And that would allow me to make my marks and to be sure that I've got accurate uh, distances. These are an absolute godsend. I don't think they're very expensive. I bought this years ago. Um, I used to, well, I won't say buy. I bought this years ago. Um, and I, I, it's just invaluable for scratch building and getting things accurate. And the main, I've seen the difference that this has made over using the ruler, which I was using before, in the, uh, the, the fewer number of times that I have to recut things because I thought I'd cut two separate pieces out at the same distance, only to discover one was bigger or smaller than the other. So I would urge you to get yourself a set of these if you want to do accurate cuts and measuring. So that's the measurement. I've just about gone over five, five minutes, but that's tool time tips for this edition.
time to complete the work in building of the station. Uh, I've decided actually to fix the roof on permanently because actually there's very good access from below. Uh, the, I don't really need to have the roof loose and it just makes it easier when you're moving the building around. And also I needed to be able to put the barge boards on. If I turn you around, you will now see that the barge boards are in place. Uh, and that would be quite tricky to do if I had the, the roof free. I can see them just getting knocked off. But I think they really, um, really set the ends of the building off really well. I'm really pleased with those. So the building is completed. And now what I've started doing is putting on the guttering. Uh, and I've decided, I, originally my intention was to use the guttering uh, and use the method of putting wire around and then drilling a small hole here, inserting the wire and the wire then supports the guttering. But the depth between the edge of the roof and the wall is quite substantial. So I've gone with the uh, approach that I used before of create by uh, making some brackets onto which the guttering sits. Uh, and this is what I've made it from. Now this is actually channel. So uh, as you buy it, it's, I think it's the 6.3 millimeter width channel. That's the distance between the two lips if I bring this in here. You'll see that I've cut the lip off completely from this side, uh, which obviously gives me the, an L shape. And I've then cut the individual, let me just put that in my hand, the individual brackets. They've been painted black uh, and then I've stuck the, the four on here. There's one here, one here, one here, and one there. And then I can just rest the um, guttering, which is uh, half round strip styrene. Um, and I've used a slightly smaller uh, half round than I've used before. And I think actually it's probably better in scale. The downpipe is more of the steel core rod. Um, which I think may be a plastruct product. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not evergreen, um, but if I bring it in here, this is this is the thing. And as you can see, it's it, um, well, you probably can't see, <laughs> but that is uh, really quite strong, uh, and then bent to fit and attached to the outside. So this side now has its guttering and downpipe on. And I will now move to the other side of the building where I'll put the guttering and down pipes for the front, uh, which will then be this bit, this building done. And I then need to put guttering onto the uh, good shed and the engine shed. Uh, and you'll see when you come to see the engine shed that I did weaken uh, and put the, this tiling on. And I have to say the transformation was astonishing. Uh, I was amazed at how much difference it's made to it. Um, you can make your own mind up when you get to see it. So what I, I didn't want to get too far in finishing this without being able to show you the little brackets. I will now carry on and complete these three buildings. Um, and that will then have them all ready to be installed when my uh, power distribution board arrives and I can start lighting them up. So I'll come back when I've finished all the, all the work on, on these. Uh, and show you the next stage in the build of High Elven. Well, I hope you enjoyed that edition of Elven Home. Sorry to leave you on the cliff edge at uh, Sharky's End, uh, but we're not quite ready yet to make the journey all the way into High Elven. Uh, but with luck, by the time you come next time, if the uh, power distribution board has arrived, then I'll have everything put in up that end, and we can take the train cam all the way into the buffers at High Elven. Uh, the train cam has been missing for quite a while, um, partly because when uh, the operating system was upgraded for my Mac, uh, Windows stopped supporting certain codecs that worked on 32-bit technology. I'm talking as if I understand what I'm talking about, but of course I don't. Uh, but what it did mean was that I could no longer use the train cam. But I finally saw some software that can convert the file uh, into a, uh, a form that uh, the Mac can use and so TrainCam will be back and making more appearances which I'm really pleased about because as some of you will know it's an adapted spy pen and at Engage there are very very few cameras that even have the slightest possibility of being able to be used for the running shots you can position them but it's the running shots that I like doing uh, which I didn't do so much in these ones but which if you've got other trains running they're just all too big so that's it for this uh, edition. Uh, if you've enjoyed the uh, video, please do give it a thumbs up. 
If you haven't subscribed yet, well, please do subscribe and hit the bell notifications and say all notifications so that you know when I'm uploading because it'd be great to have you along. If you've got any comments, please do let me have the comments. I'm really enjoying answering all the comments that uh, people give and I'm always happy if there's any help I can give from things that I've done uh, to pass that on because I learned a great deal from various videos and uh, YouTubers when I was first starting out. I'm only four years in but I'm feeling like an old boy already uh, which I'm rapidly turning into. So until I see you again in a fortnight's time that's bye-bye from me. Bye-bye.